Hello folks, Professor Fiore here, and in this video we are going to take a look at the relationship between low frequency performance of an amplifier, the F1, the half power or minus 3 dB frequency at the low end, the base end, and the sag time of a square wave. Now if you haven't seen the first video on this that looks at uh, F2, the upper break, and rise time, you probably want to take a look at that one first. This is sort of the flip, right? This is the bottom end version. And here we go. So sag time. I'll define this in greater detail in a sec. Sag time is associated with the lower 3 dB frequency. And like the rise time F2 relationship, the sag time F1 relationship, are related. They are sort of two views on to the same thing, the same phenomenon. As I said in the other video, you could think of this as maybe looking at a statue in a room from two different windows. You have two different views, but it's the same thing that you're looking at. All right. So you have a system with a single clearly dominant low frequency network, you can prove, you can show that the F1, the lower frequency limit, would be equal to 0.35 divided by the sag time. And I have a proof of this in the text that looks at uh, rise time, but it's essentially the same proof when you look at the sag time. Sag time is defined uh, as the amount of time it takes for a square wave to go from 90% of its peak value down to 10% of its peak value as you're measuring the top portion of the wave, the portion of the wave that should be flat, okay, horizontal. So the rise time, it's important to distinguish these things, right? The rise time is measured on the vertical bit. In other words, the, uh, the leading edge or possibly the trailing edge, right, fall time, similar thing, um, that vertical part. The sag is on the part that should be at the top and the bottom, the flat part. And as you're going to see, the waveform will sort of fall towards zero. So I want to measure the 90 to 10 percent rather than the 10 to 90, right? It's, so it's, it's similar wording, similar kind of thing, but the practical point of this is, you know, the way in which we do the measurement, all right? Important characteristic is this assumes that this top portion does in fact reach zero. If it doesn't get all the way down there, then you can't really do um, a sag time measurement and you know, the value you get for F1 will be nonsensical. So same kind of issue when we looked at uh, the F1 and rise time, you have to be careful about the input frequency, right? If the input frequency on the rise time measurement's too high, you're not gonna get a full proper rise and your T rise is going to be incorrect. So the same kind of thing happens here. We have to make sure that the frequency is low enough that we get a full sag. All right. So what is all this sag business that you're talking about? Um, if it's not very big, sometimes it's referred to as tilt. All right. So I'll show you what that looks like in just a sec. So I've got a, uh, a bifed op amp, a TL081. So this is a three and a half megahertz op amp. And I'm set, setting this up for a buffer, a, a unity gain, so I get full high frequency bandwidth. I don't want any issues, just to make this as clear as possible, I don't want to make any issues with rise time here, right? So the rise time effect is going to be inconsequential, right? In a real world circuit, especially if it's a narrow band circuit, these two things sort of interact and it gets a little tricky to do these sorts of measurements. Okay, so. I have added at the output a coupling capacitor, a 16 nanofarad coupling capacitor. The output impedance of the op amp is virtually zero. The load is 10K. So these two components create a lead network, a low frequency limiting network. And if we use our standard equation, one over two pi RC, this will work out to about one kilohertz. So this amplifier basically runs from one kilohertz for an F1 up to somewhere around three and a half megahertz for the F2, the upper limit, all right? Now, if you don't have any lead networks in the system, there is no such thing as sag time and your lower frequency limit is zero hertz, it's DC, 
okay? Let's do an analysis on this. I'm going to throw in a 1 volt peak, 100 kilohertz square wave, right? You're always doing this with square waves, pulses. So, you know, 100 kilohertz, there should be really no effect, right? This is limiting at 1 kilohertz, frequencies below 1 kilohertz. So we should actually see a pretty nice looking uh, waveform coming out of here. We should see just about a 1 volt peak, 100 kilohertz output waveform because this is just a buffer. Well, like I said, we'll probably see a little bit of rise time effect. You know, this doesn't have an infinite bandwidth, but let's see what we get. All righty. We'll get our legend over here. So the green is the VN, nice and square, very perfect looking. And then the maroon is the output. So you can see that tracks very, very nicely. Uh, there is a little bit of deviation coming up here. So this is the rise time effect, right? That three and a half megahertz that I mentioned. Um, there's a little bit of overshoot and, you know, it looks like maybe this is not perfectly flat on these horizontal bits. Okay, let's take a closer look at that, right? This little thing should be perfectly flat. And you can see it's off by like, you know, a couple of pixels basically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back in. I'm going to change my input frequency by a factor of 10. I'm going to bring this down from 100 kilohertz. I'm going to bring it down to 10 kilohertz. So in other words, this is going to last, you know, a lot longer. And maybe we can sort of see that effect a little better. So let's do another transient analysis. And this time we'll run it out to 1.2 milliseconds, get a couple of cycles. All right. So we're sped up by a factor of 10. And, you know, you can see obviously the, here's the input again is green, nice and square, looking good. Um, you know, at this scale, it's very hard to see any rise time effect. But boy, what's really obvious is this tilt in what should be something that's perfectly flat right? It's the low frequency limit. It's this C1 over here, this output coupling cap that's creating this. Now think about this in terms of your AC circuit analysis. If you had one of these, you had a power supply out here. You know, forget about the op amp. You just had a power supply and a switch. You energize the power supply. What happens? Well, initially the cap is zero. So you get the full output signal, but the cap starts to charge. And as the cap starts to charge, that means there's less and less voltage for our load. That's what we're seeing here, right? This thing is dropping down. So, if we go to an even lower frequency, this thing will continue to drop, 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 drop. And if it finally drops down to zero, then we have a full sag. And that thing we can measure and use our formula. All right, we can use our 0.35 over sag time. All right, here it hasn't gotten all the way, so we can't measure this yet. All right, so I've got another circuit over here. Pop this in. So all I've done is I've dropped down my square wave. It's still one volt peak. Um, oops, there we go. It's still one volt peak, but 500 hertz instead of the original 10 kilohertz. All right, everything else is the same. So now we should have enough time for this thing to extend out. All right, extend the time base, and there we go, right? So you now we were just looking at an area like right in here, okay? Now we have enough time for this thing to go all the way down. So this thing has to go back to zero, right? Here's your zero and there's flattening out, okay? So I need to go from 90, the 90% of this peak, which should be two volts. And I'm gonna zoom in so we can see this with a little bit more accurate, a little more accuracy. And we're gonna go down to, to uh, the 10% point, right? Gotta make sure that this thing flattens out. If it doesn't flatten out, you don't have a full sag, okay? All right, so let's zoom in on this and we'll verify, you know, what we actually have here. And that you, you could do it on the other end. You, does, you don't have to do it on, on uh, uh, you know, this positive, but you could do it on the other one. It doesn't really matter. But we can see anyway, this thing is going, to, going up to two volts, coming from zero up to two. So that looks good. All right, I think this is maybe far enough along. And let's see what we get here with our cursors. All right, so there's our, you know, our two volt, oops, our two volt peak. So I have to come down 10%, all right? So 0.9 times the two is 1.8 volts. 
and that's right about there. And then going down to 10%, which would be 0.2 volts. And, oh, you get just far enough. Okay, so that's going to be right around there. Okay, so eh, maybe there. I don't know. Somewhere around there. And I'm getting 345 microseconds, 0.35 milliseconds. All right, that's my sag time from the 90 down to the 10. Okay, put that in your formula. 0.35 divided by 0.35 milliseconds. 0.35 is canceled. You got one over milli. That's K. One kilohertz. There you go. Exactly what we expected. All right, beautiful. I mean, isn't that just a wonderful little thing? Okay, so you know maybe you can see it better, better over here. I'm going from 90% down to 10%. You just have to make sure that this thing flattens out. And when it does, then you can do the, the uh, uh, measurement on here, right? So you do the same thing on a scope. You get your cursors, put them out there, off you go. This is, you know, zoom in so you get some accuracy here. Don't try to do it, you know, if this thing is just so narrow that you can't really set up your cursors with any kind of accuracy. You really do need to zoom into that, all right? And of course, like I said, use an appropriate frequency. There's no reason to have this thing spike out and then remain flat for many, many milliseconds, right? You know, you don't have to do 50 hertz here, okay? So a little bit below the expected critical frequency, that should be sufficient, okay? So now we can see, right, between the rise time and the sag time, we can see that the square wave gives us a lot of insight into the frequency response of the amplifier. If there is no sag, if it stays flat, you know, like the green, like the input, if it stays flat, then we know that there is no lower frequency limit or the lower frequency limit is just so low, you know, that compared to our uh, desired signals, we can pretty much ignore it, right? You know, maybe we have something set up with a you know, an audio amplifier and the low frequency limit is a, you know, a fraction of a hertz. Eh, you're not even going to see the tilt, okay? Um, but we still have the vertical, right? So basically, the vertical bits tell you the high frequency performance and the horizontal bits, the flat bits, like these, they tell you something about the low frequency performance. So two different views into the same phenomenon. You can do it directly with sine waves, figure out the minus 3 dB points, right? The half power points, or you can find them with Square waves. Little caveat again, got to make sure that you have the right limits. In other words, you, you don't, in the, in the rise time, you don't have um, slewing or clipping. And the same kind of thing is true here, right? You wouldn't want this to clip. You wouldn't want this, you know, to get flat spotted. Okay. Um, slewing is probably not going to be an issue here because you're going to get up to the top and, and it's the drop that you're looking at, not, not the leading edge. Um, but you do have to make sure that you have the uh, appropriate frequencies to use, right? This thing does have to flatten out, okay? Okay, use the, use the square wave and learn something about your amplifiers. All right, any questions, throw them down in the comments. Um, and remember, as always, the book, the Op Amp book, is a free download. The links are in the video description. So until next time, this is Professor Friari saying, have a good one. Take care.